you would have seen some of those on your chair. Not, a, not only that, there's a, there's, a, there's a sticky back on there. And I can assure you, this message and other like messages that I've used just recently on my car work. They attract attention and they attract, attract questions from people. So for those of you that are game enough to put it on the side of your car, don't be backward in being forward. None yet, none yet. <laughs> I'd also like to, uh, to uh, extend a, a welcome to uh, a couple of individuals who have flown from distant places. Alan Barron from Geelong, Climate Coal, where are you Alan? Over there. Climate Coal from Geelong in Victoria. And, and last but not no means least, and he's, he's, trying to hide, he's trying to hide himself down the back there, but uh, it won't do you any good, Colin Boyce. <laughs> Colin, Colin Boyce uh, and I have been uh, uh, corresponding. This is the first time we've met. He's the uh, state uh, Liberal Party, Liberal National Party member for the seat of Collide in Queensland. And uh, he's sufficiently uh, motivated and concerned to come down and have a listen to what our guest speaker, Jim O'Brien, uh, from Ireland, has got to say. We've not met until, this e uh, until today, and what a pleasure it is to meet you. <laughs> his, heart, his heart is in the same place as ours, uh, Jim's bio. But uh, Jim spent 39 years uh, in the International Building Materials Group in, in Ireland. He joined as an ele electrical engineer. I've got an elder son who's an electrical engineer. Uh, ended up being group and technical adv advisor for the latter for 19 years, reporting to the CEO. In his, in his role, he pioneered best practice knowledge sharing across all group activities in 34 countries. Spearheaded the group's highly recognised corporate social responsibility program. Huh. As a retirement hobby, I don't know whether you find time for a retirement hobby, Jim. <laughs> Jim analyzes the su sustainability performance of all major cement companies each year. She objective climate science. And it was, it was from this conviction that the European Declaration came to be. To his pleasant surprise, Jim was recently accepted as an independent expert reviewer by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, in the drafting of its sixth coming assessment report. Jim much appreciates the opportunity to meet up and share experiences with climate realists in Australia. Hey. Over to you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you for such a wonderful welcome. I never dreamt in my life that I would meet such good friends in Australia and that the, uh, it would be about climate realism. Um, I have a presentation which I'll run through quickly and then maybe we'll open it up to Q&A because you can really get a, a much more interesting discussion going at that stage. So I'll begin my presentation uh, which is all about, first of all, thank you for the welcome, uh, talking a little bit how we came to form uh, a climate realist group in Ireland, just as one example, and how we look at the science and how we've uh, set up about communicating our message and then broadening out into talking about more cooperation at a global level. And I think the, the little picture tells you the story of where, where the alarmists are saying all jumping over the cliff face and this us are the people asking the question, are we really right the way everything is going? Um, I picked, uh, quite accidentally came into the area of climate science uh, when I was uh, in uh, working in CRH, uh, the, com the building materials company, I was asked to do a report for the board on what the implications of climate change would be for that company. Um, so that was back 10 more years ago. And even beginning uh, to look into that, it very quickly became apparent that there was more than the IPCC story that if anybody really began to sit down and look and read alternative viewpoints, 
that there were a whole lot of holes in the IPCC story and that there were a whole lot of other facts that weren't being uh, taken into account. So um, I, uh, again, having worked on that and you know received all the messages every day on the newsletters, um, I became concerned that in Ireland in particular, the Irish government was really heading down the IPCC road in its preparations for what was then the COP leading up to the Paris Agreement. So I prepared a paper um, which tried to summarize the, um, the arguments to and fro, and I'll, you can pass it around the audience, um, summarizing both the IPC story and the alternative, the solar and other prospects. So that uh, I brought into the Irish Academy of Engineering, and there was rather vested interest very becoming very apparent there in renewables and things like that. So. Um, I decided that we really needed to uh, form a little group of our own of independent climate realists. So I got together with one or two others. We formed the Irish Climate Science Forum. Um, it wasn't easy. Some people came and they had slightly different viewpoints and they wanted to do things a different way. But we formed the Irish Climate Science Forum. And we've slowly moved forward from there. And we've begun, we decided that we really should bring the best science available uh, into Ireland. So we set up a series of lectures um, using and bringing, inviting in the world's top independent scientists. So that led forward and uh, we developed um, a more precise document trying to summarize the, the arguments uh, of the, the real the climate science, you know, the fact that um, the, the models in IPCC are well overheated, that you know, the basic things about the Arctic is not disappearing, uh, the Antarctic is, is certainly very solid, and Greenland, plus a whole lot of other facts, and brought them together so we could try to start to, to lobby our government people. And we made various submissions, and um, they were totally ignored. We just got a response, we got your document, but absolutely no dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, we set up these lectures inviting in people, I'll run through them in a moment, very high flyers. But, and we invited the people from the government, from the Environmental Protection Agency, from other bodies, the Climate Change Advisory Council to the government. Would they turn up? No. You know, there's a complete much more than Australia, there is a relatively good open debate, actually, compared to Ireland. <laughs> well, that's got you going. Why don't you show us? I haven't seen it yet. Well, um, and it, believe it or not, for example, when we started to organize our lectures, we looked to various, uh, even the engineering institution, they, they wouldn't host our lecture. You know, it, it was that bad. We had to uh, host our lectures in a hotel. Well, the, uh, we could have used a golf club, I suppose. Yeah. But um, for convenience, we used a hotel. And that just shows you how anti the, closed the minds are of the government people. Mm -hmm. And they just did not wish to hear anything about an alternative viewpoint. And there's so much vested interest. And the newspapers absolutely wouldn't even entertain a letter written questioning some of their, and they, of course they have articles every day of the week on the alarmist side. So it's, it's but we've uh, formed our climate science group, we have our lectures. The word is gradually getting out that there is an alternative view on the science, and people are now finding us on the internet under the icsf.ie, and they're beginning to be much, much more open. Uh, then, yes, uh, we started to establish links with other similar-minded bodies in Europe. Of course, at the top left, the Global Warming Policy Foundation in London. Then there's a Dutch Climate Gate NL, they call themselves. Uh, there's a, a quite a strong group in France, they call themselves Climate Realists, and they actually have quite an open debate and do programs on, have been interviewed on television. They, they've made very good progress. Uh, then there's IK, the German group. Um, they also are very strong and, and work with various political parties. There's a Belgian group. And on the right-hand side, there's a Danish group, a Swedish group, 
and a Norwegian group. So that, that we're really beginning to interconnect, which is very valuable at a, at a European level, because in the Irish context, we were, we were picked off and very viciously attacked, some of our people, very viciously attacked. And even some articles, sl very slanderous articles were written and the, the authors try, went to the press um, ombudsman to, to get a fair hearing, but even the ombudsman wouldn't hear the story. It's extraordinarily closed. At the top right, uh, we're forming through that a European Climate Realists uh, Network, and that's where this European declaration originated. You know, the lecturers we had, for example, Dick Linson, he's, uh, you all know it's a household name, he is really the grandfather of climate sci realist climate science. Uh, he's uh, uh, Alfred Sloan, professor of MIT, now retired emeritus. Uh, but we had him as our first lecturer, and he, you know, brought us through the basics on the, on the bottom right there, that uh, pal uh, the paleoclimate tells us that there was absolutely no link between the global temperatures and carbon dioxide levels. They were all over the place. If anything, carbon dioxide followed temperature changes rather than leading them. And he, um, you know, looking at that may be rather complicated, but that's, that's the, the various uh, prevailing estimates of um, uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity. And Richard Linson was one of the ones who first, through his work, came to find that real climate uh, sensitivity is only about one degree. He's and got a real hockey stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's another guy called Ray Bates, who is part of our group in Ireland. He's a retired professor of meteorology, a, a great climate scientist, but he also came to the conclusion that was about one degree. And you know the rest of the story, they're all the IPCC. Despite having spent $40 billion in research, have not yet narrowed their range of sensitivity. So, you know, that's, that's uh, a scandalous, really. The, did I skip one there? I don't think so. Uh, the next... Uh, uh, person we had was Will Happer of, um, of Princeton. Uh, the little group there on the, on the left is inter uh, on the top right. Uh, there's Ray Bates is the first person, then Will Happer. He's a lovely guy. He's really very uh, relaxed. And, and he was actually advisor uh, up to recently to President Trump in the White House. Um, so he was giving really good advice, I can assure you. And then there's me, and the three people at the back are the Connolly brothers, or the Connolly family, actually. And they have done great research. Um, they're completely independent Irish uh, scientists, and they have done a lot of very good research. That, I mean, one of them is a school teacher. They're, they're, not, they're well qualified, but uh, they do brilliant research. And uh, one of their papers, for example, is that they, having dis recently got a whole lot of Russian temperature data released after the Cold War, they actually were able to deduce that there was an Arctic melt in the 1930s, as, uh, you know, just as, as now, and, and that had built up since again. And they've done work, for example, on Chinese temperature data that shows that when you really boil down and look for um, temperature sets that are not affected by urban heat island, there's hardly any temperature rise, maybe half a degree in the last 150 years. And they've now done some work, which I, I haven't studied, but they believe that there's possibly no, absolutely no greenhouse gas effect at all. So, interesting stuff. Anyhow, Bill ha Will Happer is very much on the, the decreasing effect of CO2 because it's logarithmic, so doubling it actually is, keeps on reducing and reducing. And he's very much focused on agricultural emissions, uh, emissions. In other words, that the methane and nitrous oxide are already blocked out by water vapor and, and other. Uh, so this, which is, that's particularly important for Ireland because 33% of our emissions are agricultural. And I was talking to the guys in New Zealand where they're showing in particular that for methane and nitrous oxide, the effect of doubling those is actually negligible in the whole uh, picture of, of global warming potential. So, and that, that will be dramatic and it really is important for the, the agricultural sector. Um, and they, they, they have done great work and that is shortly to be published. Then we had, we took a look at the solar side and we had Henrik Svensmark of, of the Danish University 
And you know, he's done his, his pioneering work is on the relationship between cosmic rays and, and temperature. And uh, because of the link between sunspots, uh, cosmic rays being deflected or not, the formation of clouds, and the effect thereby on, on uh, global temperature, which is explaining how uh, changes in, in, in sunspots can have a big amplifying effect on global temperature. So by, by tracing, as he did, uh, cosmic ray trends through the, over the last thousand years, he was able to replicate the temperature changes right through the uh, Little Ice Age and, and the other periods. So that, that is pioneering work that can show uh, that there is a very much different explanation that can really explain an awful lot and maybe everything. Yeah. Uh, so um, he, <laughs> he ran into quite a, some difficulty in his, but he really persisted. Uh, his difficulty was demonstrating that the uh, cosmic rays could lead to cloud formation. But he's come through that, and his work is <coughs> certainly very, very sound. Then the comp very comprehensive to him is Nir Shaviv, the Israeli. Um, he's done brilliant work. And, and uh, from the bottom diagrams, you can see he's really gone back through the Earth's evolution to trace the, the, um, the link between cosmic rays and global temperatures and, and climate change over, over millennia. And um, you know, when, when again, when you take in the top right graph, uh, um, superimpose what he can explain in terms of global temperatures going forward, the, the, you know, the sort of even if whatever um, greenhouse gas effect there is could lead to a maximum rise of about one degree per se. So it really is putting a different perspective on the whole thing. It's not at all just about CO2. There are a whole lot of other things going on. And then we had a guy, Nicola Scafeta, he's in the middle of that picture. A, an Italian guy, very, very, very uh, animated. And in that picture, actually, is, is a group where, where we brought together several of the European groups. On the left, you have Benny Pizer of the UK, London, Global Warming. Uh, the second is Wolfgang Müller, who is uh, very much part of the German Association. Uh, in the middle is Nicolas Scafeta, me. And then you have uh, Benoit Rito on the right of the French Association. They're all very friendly, you can see, putting the arm around and all the rest. Uh, but they're a great group of people and, and, and very, very focused. And bright. And bright, yes, very bright, yeah. And, um, you know, Nicolas Scafeta took things uh, by looking at the, all the trends in, um, the, in temperature variation and relating it to solar cycles and other planetary motion um, deduced you know, that he can, through that process, you can explain an awful lot of the recent uh, global warming, very specifically in terms of particular cycles of the moon and other planets. So it again puts a completely different picture on the, the whole climate scene. And again, looking at when he put his picture in that and projecting that these conti will continue forward in the future, again, it shows that he, in his view, you cannot have more than one degree of CO2 related or greenhouse gas related uh, climate change. So all of those pictures and all of those scientists from quite different viewpoints show very much that CO2, it's not just CO2, that there are other things in play and that CO2 is, is, relative, is very mu much minor than IPCC says. And that is, is amazing. Then we had Pat Michaels of the Cato Institute. He's very much a lukewarmer, as you might guess from the title. But again, it's the same thing that, you know, the, the, there is, we would accept overall, a small greenhouse gas effect, but much, much lower than what IPCC are saying. It doesn't like warmth. Yeah, exactly. And, and equally, that warmth benefits the planet and, and that the CO2 benefits the planet. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, he, you know, puts the social car, car, cost of carbon actually at negative rather than uh, a, very positive, a very positive figure. So, you know, the, all of those things in this classical graph again shows how much the actual global temperatures as measured by balloons and satellite are lying well below the IPCC AR5 models. 
And in fact, there's only one model, it's a single line at the bottom, a Russian model that is getting things about right. So it just shows, and that curve is widening, it's already more than half degree and, and is really just uh, showing that IPC models are totally wrong. And you know, there's more and more uh, papers that have come out that shows the IPC model is quite arbitrary in fact. It's just, you know, th there is no foundation to it. <laughs> You're an easy Aussie, Aussie audience to talk to. Uh, then we had John Christie. He's the famous guy of, of the, 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 again, of this curve which he presented to the U.S. Congress showing how the actual temperatures are way, way below what the IPC projections are. And equally in terms of the troposphere, having measured uh, the, simply the hot spot predicted by the IPCC models mm -hmm. doesn't at all exist. And equally, you know, if you... Um, uh, were to s suddenly stop, however, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that it would have practically zero effect on, on global temperatures. And equally, that all of the predictions of doom and gloom of the last 20 years or more have never, none have proven to be actually real. Just looking at some kind of broader th things about extreme events and, and taking Greenland as one example, because it's so much talked about. And this, the top curve is the through the year, the, the uh, incremental gain and loss of, of snow and ice mass. You know, at times during the winter, it's been much colder than normal, and, and they, that they all say, oh, that's the weather. But then in July, August, there was this supposedly big melt, and they say, oh, it's climate change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all weather. It's always that, they say, isn't it, wouldn't they? Um, but again, you know, they talk of maybe of a billion tons melt, but that's point zero 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 something of, of, of the total ice mass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, again, looking at this year's figure, the blue line, it's well within the, the typical average, so certainly Greenland is not melting. And on the right-hand side is a kind of a 10,000-year uh, time scale of the Greenland ice mass, ice mast mass and again it's varied up and down and certainly what modern day stuff is 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 absolutely nothing exceptional and again looking at the arctic you know the 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 temperature changes if you go back to the 1930s there were warm periods in the arctic as well which correspond to the dust bowl in the u.s and equally the whole the antarctic while cooling has had a recent little bump but i mean that's nothing in the context of the past and, you know, the uh, people talk about sea level rise, but again, the simple fact is the top right that is uh, measured according to satellite is just over three millimeters a year. <laughs> so, I mean, by 2100, maybe t another 25 centimeters. So, you know, that's no emergency. There is no emergency. That's a that's simple fact. Okay, over very long time scales, there have been major sea level changes but certainly not in modern times, and that, that is, you know, uh, I, and I think that sea level thing of just 25 centimetre is something that you can really put out to the politicians because it's, it's, it's so simple, it's so small, it, it simply says very clearly that there is no climate emergency. And equally, if you look at the temperatures and project forward from the, the, the slope of the actual measurements, you get about 0.1 of a degree per decade so by 2100, maybe you certainly have less than one degree extra. So I think that is a particularly two particularly important points to make to the politicians that look, the facts are telling us that at most we'll have one degree, probably less, by 2100, and 25 centimetre sea level rise. So what's the emergency? Let's, let's do things, let's spend our money properly rather than spending it on, on crazy projects. Yeah, and actually the, 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 the actual datum uh, uh, data, if you analyse that, it comes to down to about one millimetre per year. And I don't know how, I can't explain the difference between the satellite figure and the... <laughs> well, we found in Ireland in particular, it appears that the datum points are, are sinking. Uh, because, because they're building so much near them. Yeah, or abstra abstra abstracting water that the actual uh, level is, is sinking and that's thereby producing an apparent sea level rise. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
But again, looking at you know temperature data over over the the last since the the the, the last um, ice age, you know there have been the warm periods, the the medieval warming, which they are trying very hard to delete, and the Roman warming period and the Minoan warming period, and you know temperatures were considerably higher than now. So it's um, it's really you know that. Those data tell you very simply there is no emergency. We're, we're, in fact, we're, we're blue and lucky to be in the, the climate we have now. It could have been, it was much colder over the, 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 the little ice age. And again, at the top right are the, over the last uh, four interglacials, uh, we're at a happy point now of, of having good temperature. It was slightly higher at various points, but let's enjoy it before the next ice yeah, age comes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's that's the one reason for conserving fuel resources. Actually, we'll need them very badly in the in the next ice age. So again, looking at the solar picture, uh, there there are a lot of people that say you know the the, the the sunspot trends and changes and the solar cycles. There are many that postulate that cycle twenty five may lead to a cooling, a very significant cooling in the next decade or two. So we'll see how it works out. And you know, looking at other things like the top left are the European um, uh, fire uh, outbreaks, and you know, there's a it's a declining trend overall. Yeah. And looking at Brazil on the top right, you know, so much all over the news of the fires in Brazil, but they're nothing compared with what they were a decade ago. You know that those basic facts don't don't come through. And then in looking at global fire levels, there's also a, a declining. Trend. Despite what you see, see the anthropogenic effect is video cameras all over the place and immediately going online and on the news headlines. For Australia, I'd love to see more a trend. You know, you see it on, I saw it on the television this morning and the fires and so on. But it would be great to have more extended data so you can say, is, is it getting more or is it less than it was? And, you know, it, it's important that you kind of can establish that data more firmly. It's on the Bureau of Meteorology site. Okay, good. And is it declining uh, or going it's, up? It's uh, pretty, pretty stable. Over okay, well, that's so interesting got, in itself. They've got from uh, 1918 to 2019. Okay, okay. Yeah, so they've got 101 years worth of data. Okay, but, and the other factor, incidentally, in all of that is that with the increased, slightly increased CO2 level, there is more uh, photosynthesis and more stuff to burn. So that's the effect that, that has to be taken into account. Um, and looking again at the number of tornadoes in the US, actually declining trend on the top right, the number of category five hurricanes in the Atlantic. Okay, uh, the Bahamas was really a tragedy, but it's nothing new. When you go back, it's all there. And, but of course, they, the media tell you, this is unprecedented, that's their favorite word. And similarly, the, um, the, the droughts in the US, you know, back, big peaks in the 1930s, the 1950s. And if you look at rainfall, just the example of Ireland, it's been up and down all over the place. And despite being the reputation of a rain, every, there have been huge droughts in the past. So weather is, is very variable and, and uh, don't rush to any conclusions. That one uh, is of interest. Uh, maybe you know more about it than I, but it's the, the coral bleaching over 400 years. And it's shown to be greater in, 1790 and 1850. So, I mean, that, uh, that, that is really important stuff. Uh, and, you know, we get all the stuff in the Peter Ridd's sad story about the, you know, supposed destruction of the, of the coral uh, through bleaching. But so it's important to establish facts on what really has happened and, and this show that there's nothing unprecedented. Uh, temperature measurements uh, at the top left, you know the story of the, the uh, I believe more and more UHI effect, the, the urban heat island effect. There are so many temperature um, measurement pl places that are now situated at airports or whatever, and they're being surrounded by buildings, and there's a completely artificial picture emerging of, of temperatures rising simply because where they're located. Whereas, and there's probably nearly, certainly more than half a degree, maybe even a degree in average. Uh, and uh, so it's really important, and I think more research needs to be done on that, and perhaps even in Australia, 
uh, to, to determine where your measurement points are and to really even photograph them so you can build up a picture of is, are these temperatures real or not. And when you look at the, the news this morning, you see the top of Australia and the b burning ember diagrams and heat and heat and heat. But they're showing very hot temperatures in places where there are no temperature measurements, I'm sure, right in the middle of the country. They just make it up. Yeah, well, you know, that comes back. You've got to have facts. And I, I think here in Australia, you can help us greatly. I, I'm talking the global sense by the more information you can gather on that kind of thing. Two years ago, they closed down the coldest weathering station in Australia at Charles Park. They closed it down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the problem, and so, some other countries are, I believe in Canada, actually destroying old temperature records, yeah. which yeah. is criminal. Um, well, you see, when it comes between facts and religion, religion always wins out. <laughs> you, you could do the lecture for me here. <laughs> Again, uh, the top right, Australia there, the, the, the temperature data, and that really comes back. Is Australia really getting hotter? Uh, well, <laughs> get the facts, please. <laughs> and, you know, the, the um, satellite data, which we all, every month, monitor. And again, it shows the ups and downs, but actually the, the planet is cooling since the last uh, uh, El Nino in 2015-16. And, uh, you know, just taking uh, temperatures for, you know, any country over any period, they really are moving N at n not at all, if you can see the data. So, coming back, um, we, uh, in, in linking up with the European associations, we started saying, well, we really need to get our act together as a group. So, um, we decided we'd write a, what we call a European declaration. And that would be that we'd get a very basic statement, uh, if you can read it on the right, climate change is, is happening, but it's not much less than IPCC predicts. Uh, CO2 is the basis of life, and the, um, there's no, actually no increase in natural disasters. It's, it, the, the, the records are there, which show if you go through them uh, carefully, things just happened in the past. So we developed this uh, simple one-letter climate uh, declaration, and it was originally intended to go, to go to European politicians, but because of the urgency of, of uh, the Guterres summit recently, we decided we'd send the first edition to him. And um, so at that stage, we have developed, um, we've got over 500 signatures from 13 countries, 15 countries already, and it's extending by the day, literally. But it is a, a very good initiative to say that there is no climate emergency, because, uh, you know, the facts are, that's what the facts are saying. And um, that uh, will be going to the European politicians. We have a conference in Oslo in about two weeks' time, and we will be re refining that and bringing it together and then sending it to the European politicians. But it's hugely valuable to us that we now have signatures from Australia, from New Zealand. Uh, we, uh, we have them from Latin America, from the United States, from Canada, and of course, practically every country in Europe. Um, and that, you know, is really, uh, of course, the alarmists are saying, well, who are these guys? And they don't know anything. But, you know, it is a tremendously important gathering of, of forces together because up to now in each country, they picked us off as being the lunatics, if you like, as being the, so now we're gathering together and hugely valued. And that's why I hugely value being here, uh, connecting directly with people in Australia, climate realists. And uh, we intend to uh, launch it to, to European politicians in a couple of weeks' time because the, the new European Commission uh, is elected and takes office on the 1st of November. And then we're planning a global release in uh, November uh, through press conference in Brussels in advance of the COP25 in Chile. So it's really rolling forward and I think it's a very powerful statement. Uh, we've already been heavily criticised, but <laughs> we're also going to simply get the facts together uh, about what is really happening. Um, just looking at, at you guys and your, your national energy uh, policy, yeah, that's, I admire all you're doing. Um, 
exiting the Paris Accord, that's up to you guys. Um, uh, I'm sure the people in this room would certainly vote that way. Um, I think, as I had said, it's important that you get as much data uh, on what things happening in Australia that you can, because it's very important, not just for Australia, but everywhere, that we can say and that you can prove and that, you know, if you can prove for your temperature data that is biased or whatever, you can get that published, not, not by peer review, but by in the likes of, of Benny Pizer's um, network, his newsletters. He'd publish that thing, and that goes global. So it's really important to get the facts out. We need more and more facts. And, you know, uh, somebody winced when I said I, I put myself forward. We have to try and influence IPCC from the inside as well as from the outside. And that's why, believe it or not, I signed up as chair of the Irish Climate Science Forum to become an IPCC independent reviewer. And to my surprise, they accepted it. So I've made pretty stinging comments on the first order draft of AR6. <laughs> <laughs> As have many others, you know, and uh, I, I hope you guys, some of you guys might actually think of the same thing because you can fight them from inside as well. They may th and probably will reject any comments, but at least it, it's, it gives you more ammunition afterwards if they say they haven't, if they shows that they haven't listened to them. And, um, you know, it also gives you a, an early uh, insight into what they're thinking of in, in AR6. And I mean, guess what? Solar is a half page, just dismissed. And uh, they're developing what they call CMI6 models, which are still more uh, blown up in terms of future uh, temperatures and so on. It's, it's quite incredible. They, they just have, but I hope that by this um, uh, climate initiative and just getting so many different people and getting the message out there, there is an alternative view. I hope that will bring IPCC to its senses, that they can't get away with this bluff any longer, uh, that the truth has to emerge. And that really is the very, very important uh, thing to, that, that we're all about. And I think that, you know, I, I'm optimistic that in the next, within the next five years, that is within the AR6 cycle, that the IPCC house of cards will be severely challenged and will collapse simply due to lack of, of um, substance in their models, and they have to start getting realistic. There's no transparency in the modelling. There's no transparency, no. Right. It's completely yep. opaque. Yep. Well, that's a massive red flag, and it wasn't addressed in AR5, so they're going to have a go at it in AR6, yep. and that's where you can come in. Yep. Well, well I'm, I'm just okay. nearly there anyway, because um, distribution and so on. And the other factor at the bottom right is the, is the, global, is the urbanization that the bigger cities are getting bigger and bigger, just as, as Sydney here, I'm sure. That there, there's, and, and when you travel throughout Asia, you see the size of cities, where there are cities with a greater population that, than that of all of Australia. And that presents huge problems in terms of infrastructure and just so people can live decently. So I think those are the real challenges, global population growth, urbanization, water scarcity, food distribution, migration, and maybe coming into the next ice age. So that was a summary of <laughs> life as I see it. I'm delighted to be here. And maybe an example of sustainable transport. <laughs> 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 More closely at that picture, I just realized that it was a steam engine. So <laughs> good old fossil fuel. But on that, you could get more than your trousers singed. <laughs>
Well, I've got a professional background in the international telecommunications field and my other fellow peers, both here in Australia and also in Europe, uh, counselled me otherwise and said, no, we think you should sign it. So I relented and I, I did so. And I think... <coughs> in, in yeah, it's, it's, it uh, yeah it, it, it's, you don't have to... Well, what is a climate scientist? Yeah. What trade is it really? <laughs> there isn't... There isn't but it, it, it comes to a person who has looked at the facts and is convinced. And we've, our group's been running for about 12, 13 years now. And uh, Mike and I started it um, and we're still here. Yep. So I, I, I know from as a result of your coming this evening, there is at least two, and I would predict at least three. And I, maybe I'll just mention them. There's Arthur standing here, sitting in front of me. And there's Jim directly behind you. And there's Charlie who's standing up, uh, who in my judgment have uh, certainly got a depth of uh, knowledge and qualification to uh, be, be considered. Yeah. To be signatures. <laughs> so uh, with, with uh, the uh, European Climate Realist support, uh, I'll drop a note to uh, Edward, mm -hmm. and with at least three people's names. And my dad. And your and your dad. And my dad as well. He needs he needs to be prepared to put his name to it now. To be fair, to be fair, there have been some names that I've put forward who have declined to have their name added to it for the reasons best known to them. And some of them are quite large organisations. So I won't mention who. Uh, they surprise me a little bit for the reasons best known to themselves, they chose not to have their names associated with it. But uh, that's OK. Uh, they blacklist them. <laughs> they, 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 they no doubt have very good reasons why they choose not well, to. They're still working. There's career problems. Uh, these are organisations uh, in this case, uh, Arthur. Anyway, uh, I, I, I'd be uh, relatively certain that there'll be a few more starters from down under Great. who would be happy to uh, add their names to the EC. Uh, European Climate Declaration, but I hope in the fullness of time, sooner rather than later, might morph into a world climate declaration. It will, it will, that right. is planned, yeah, yes, it is. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. ideally yeah. where it needs to head. Yeah. children can go home and enjoy their lives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> so if there's, if there's others for questions, just put your hand up first and give Frank the opportunity to hold the microphone nearby. Void. Uh, good day. Yeah, um, loved all your graphs and everything. Uh, I suspect that if uh, if you sat uh, a politician down here, he'd go blank within about thirty seconds. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so my question is really is um, I'd like you to comment on the other aspect of climate change, which is the psychology. Right. What is the psychology which is driving all this stuff from the point of view of politicians? Why are they kind of like falling in, falling like flies? behind this god that not, they're... Not all of them. There are a few exceptions. we got one good one here. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, and uh, so why, why are they falling down in front of all this, like worshipping? worshipping? And why is this current hysteria happening where people are actually... We've got people crying and saying that they're not going to have children and, and they're imparting all of this horrible kind of fear into their own children. Uh, what, what is driving this? Well, is there something kind of deeper which is driving it all? It's money. You know, well, money in the sense of, of some of the very rich people of the world seeing this as uh, maybe just a ma means of disrupting society. I don't know what their, their aims it's a are. Agenda, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a. And, and there's. Um, I, th I think a lot of, certainly in Europe, uh, the, the, the politicians think this to, to be the utopia of the future. And of course, when you're talking 2050, it's well beyond their, their, their political lifetimes anyway. So they th it puts them on a high ground, so to speak. And they think that they are really doing the right thing. Uh, unfortunately, they don't understand that the consequences of going that route has severe economic implications not just for Ireland, but for every country <laughs> doing all those things. And, and no, none of them have dared to sit down and make an estimate of the cost of, of getting to even 2030 targets, uh, uh, let alone the 2050. But it, it has become uh, a, a religion and you know, they believe, they're, they think they're doing the right thing, which is extremely un bad for 
top level politicians, you think that they should brief themselves more broadly on the science. So I just, I just posit that that may be a, another strategy. Like you've got a scientific strategy, mm -hmm. presenting the facts, which I can respect because I've got a science, scientist and engineering background. Yeah. But another strategy is, is that uh, you, know, you, you could actually be causing harm to, to, for the prosperity of future generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and yeah. what, what is the harm that's being caused by this, which doesn't seem to be ever to be discussed. Yeah, well, I think it's becoming very clear on the eco-anxiety aspect of, of, our, of children, that they are really getting screwed up. And, and you know, I think there's, I, I think the alarmists are beginning to see that they've overdone it. I think they are, and I think there will be a, a, a gradual backlash. And, and I think th even in Ireland, I sense the effect of, of sort of the men in the street saying, what is really going on here? And, and yeah, yeah, and, and they're really overcooking the goose. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think, and the other thing that's happening in parallel, that our government in Ireland is talking about carbon taxes, carbon taxes, and oh, you, you can't have, you can't buy, buy a new um, a central heating boiler for oil or gas after another five years, and another 10 years, you can't buy a petrol or diesel car. So those kind of things are really beginning to get upset in people you know they they we are a democracy okay you can put extra taxes on a, on a diesel car if you want to but at least we should have the freedom of choice and I think those kind of things are really beginning to go up the nose of, of the the voting punter well, I mean, somebody asked Bill Shorten just before the election that's the Labour um, Party leader um, what was the cost of their climate policy and he wouldn't tell anybody he didn't know <laughs> he didn't know yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's a question for the, on the political side. The, the politicians usually um, won't act unless there's a political reason to act. Mm -hmm. So the question is for the politician as well. Colin. Well, Colin, well, what is the potential political reason for the coalition to turn on this? What, what, what can trigger a turning of the coalition's view on all this? Um, ladies and gentlemen, you got a chance to introduce uh, Colin. Colin Boyce, you happy to be introduced here, Colin? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Colin Boyce is with the uh, Liberal National Party, currently in opposition with the Queensland government. He uh, he's flown down particularly for uh, for this event. Uh, yeah, I have not met until tonight, but I still f feel as though we're old friends, having spoken on the phone and exchanged more than a few emails over the past couple of years. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you along, Colin. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I'll try and address your question as simply as I can. Um, so the first thing that uh, I have to say to you is, is that I'm not a politician. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm an ordinary businessman uh, making my way in the world. and. I became so frustrated with um, with politics, I decided to join it and see if I could make a difference. And that's it, purely and simply. Um, I'm a one-term politician. I've been in the job for two years. The biggest thing that sticks out to me is, is that most people are there in politics because it's a job, pure and simple. They need the money that that earns them to pay their bills and educate their children and make their investments and make their way in the world. Um, I am different from most of those people because I don't seriously do not need to be here for the money. Um, I've got plenty of money. Um, what they pay me to be is a politician. <laughs> no, no, I am dead serious when I say this to you. When, it, when the money they pay me as a politician, I do not need that as a job. I can go home and earn a lot more money. Um, so the problem is with most politicians is, is that they up upset the boat, they rock the boat, they create a problem, they risk losing their job, they risk losing their position. And that influences their decision making process. And that's it in a nutshell. That's what I have observed in two years in the job. Um, so, listening to what you were describing earlier about banging your head against a bureaucratic brick wall in Ireland, 
I couldn't, couldn't help but remember the old saying, it's hard to get someone to understand something if they think their job depends on not understanding it. So I couldn't but help think that, is it possible that because anthropogenic global warming is an EU policy, is it possible the Irish government has no latitude but to reject any alternative explanation and it's really being driven from Brussels? Yeah, there is very much, uh, in Ireland's case, I would say, of bowing to Brussels, um, partly because the country uh, has received a lot of economic support from Brussels, and partly because of the context of Brexit. Who would think Brexit would come up in this conversation? But they need to be, they need to be closely ally allied with Europe, and um, that is very much, uh, and Europe is setting the goals uh, for 2030 and 2050. I mean, 2030, it had, it had said, uh, set a 40% reduction goal versus 2005, and now they, they are trying to make it 50% or even 55%. But fortunately, several of the European countries, are, uh, Eastern European countries, are saying, no, thank you, yeah. because Poland relies very much on its coal. Uh, Hungary has got, uh, you know, they're pretty... Uh, stand back, leave us alone. Mr. Orban is very strong in that respect. And then you have uh, Czech Republic and so on that are very strongly anti. So that's the way the politics is in, in, in Europe at the moment. And um, yeah, for that reason, Ireland has been bowing to Brussels and would not dare to depart uh, from that uh, theme, unfortunately. And that's why we developed the declaration as a European declaration to go to the top level, the new uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, wow. and the new, um, the new incoming uh, Council President, and the new President of the European Parliament. They probably will just throw it out the window, but you know we are beginning at least to show them there is an alternative point of view, and that it's going to cost. I, I firmly believe the European economy is already going down the plug hole yeah. because. Yeah. Because of all this thing, uh, they are uh, putting, the, for example, the energy costs in Europe are the highest in the world compared to other regions. And the, there are various other things going on that they, they, they will have to wake up to in, in, in the coming years. So um, yeah, it's difficult, but that's the reason why we're focusing on the broader European scene. And then we'll, we'll equally represent it in all our own countries, you know, copy the letter to our own um, Prime Minister and, and Energy Minister and so on. So, yeah, very much that focus. Um, thanks very much for your talk, Jim. It's been very good. Um, uh, have you heard of Dr. Ed Berry? I have heard of him, yes. Yeah, yes. his work on, um, on the IPCC modelling is absolutely brilliant. Yep. He's got a series of slides, very simple to understand, that any layman can look at it and yep. see what the problem is like. For example, the IPC treat human emissions differently from other carbon, which is nonsense. They give yep. it a greater mm -hmm. life and all yep. this sort of stuff. So um, if people aren't aware of Dr. Ed Berry, um, just Ed Berry, just Google it. It's brilliant. Go and have a mm -hmm. look at it. Yep. And the other thing I just quickly I wanted to say is, um, have you heard of, a, it's a bit old now, but it's a brilliant book called The Resourceful Earth by Simon and Kahn? No, I haven't heard of that Well, one. basically, they, they were having a debate with Eric, um, the, the American uh, population guy, who was yep. saying, oh, because of all the increase in population, we're going to have increased uh, production costs, uh, food is going to become scarcer, commodity prices are going to rise, standard of living is going to go down. And they said, no, we, we, we'll make a bet with you. We'll come back in 20 years and we'll just compare. We say the opposite will happen. Yeah, yes, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, and they came back in 20 years and they won the bet handsomely. Yep. So increased population does not equate with starvation or rising problems. Actual fact, the converse is true. We actually have an increase in living standards, a longer lifespan and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I haven't seen any update of their book, but it might be worth, you know, just um, considering their, their premise that... that, that uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I was just pointing out that they are the the real challenges of the growing population yeah. and so on. And you know, the the talking of Gut Guterres in the UN, his focus sh should be stopping wars, yeah. Not, yeah. Not, not climate change. You know, and probably he he he's so 
in, in unable to do anything in the, what his proper job is, the sort of climate change is the, the hobby. Uh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Uh, so I've, I've I've been having a lot of conversations with friends of mine who follow the climate science, uh, and they adopt the so-called you know, so consensus view. Um, and I linked one of them recently that paper showing that of the 32 models collated by the IPCC, only the one from uh, Richard Lindzen had accurately predicted the way the temperatures would go. And he said, "Oh, great. Uh, look." That it says that, but I can link you 10 papers saying that the IPCC has generally gotten it correct. So what I'm wondering is what sort of flaws in either the way the data is collected or the methodology or the way they're drawing inferences can I, should I be looking out for when someone sends me some of this research? Um, yeah, you have to, yeah, you see the, the, the whole IPCC consensus and establishment, call it that, they are very clever at sticking together. And they will sort of continue to propagate their story uh, until literally the world starts cooling. So I think uh, that's why uh, in this European declaration and in a wider global declaration, uh, declaration, it is important to show that there are a heck of a lot of scientists out there that have the alternative point of view and that we are saying as realists, we are willing to have a debate. Uh, the problem with uh, most of the consensus of the establishment is they do not wish to discuss anything because they're afraid to, I suspect. They, they have simply put their face in, in, the, in the model, the IPCC models, and are unwilling to sort of enter any kind of dialogue of our discussion. And I think the, the, our group, they call them the realists, have issued now that challenge. Look, let's have a debate. If, if, and, and that's very important to open up the topic. The, the guys who say that, they, they, those models outputs are submitted to them from different modeling groups around the world, and they quite candidly <coughs> say in their by report that they do not know how those results were obtained. Yep, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They yeah, don't yeah. know. So that's it, the answer, but they don't know either. It's, it, it, the, the models have been a black box. There have been a number of papers that have opened them up, opened up the black box and Trump shown them years. to be. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I noticed. I noticed Colin has, has got a, a, a comment to make there. Colin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I had a question. Uh, I had a question. Basically, um, one of the problems I face as a parliamentarian, not a politician, there is a difference, um, is that. We are facing uh, a generation of indoctrination through the education system and through the media that believes that science has reached consensus and 97% of scientists agree and you've all heard the story and we all know the, uh, the reality of it and we can all explain it in several pages of, of uh, rhetoric. How do you reduce 97% of scientists agree to a 10-word sentence? For, for politicians, <laughs> that's a challenge. Yeah, well, that, Euro <laughs> that European declaration is in effect stating the main points. We accept, actually we are, as realists, part of the 97%. It, uh, all we say, however, is that the warming is much less due to greenhouse gases is much less than predicted in the models. I know that message is a bit subtle for some politicians, but that's what we are saying. One of the realities of, the, of that statement, 97% of scientists agree and consensus has been reached, if you analyse the facts of it, you get down to 57 people. Oh uh, yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, yeah, it's a totally... And, and the, I yeah. have friends who are very eminent scientists and they will all tell you, nobody ever rang me about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, the it's, point is that yeah, the average it, man in the street believes this stuff. Yeah, that's the problem, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, who gets the opportunity to debate these things and make comment on these things, I need to be able to uh, counter this with a simple statement, and mm -hmm. it is very difficult to do that. Yeah. Yeah, the 97% the, the is, is a fake. Yeah. Like that stupid yeah. credit yeah. person. Ninety-seven percent of our men. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know there are, but you, 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 what Connie's looking for is, is a yeah, short, yeah, half yeah. launch The point I'm trying to make is, yeah. is that we as a group of people need to be able to counter that simple statement yeah. of 97 percent of yeah. scientists agree. You've got to reduce that down into a similar statement yep. that counters it. Yep. Yeah. It's just well, as punchy. Two yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, it's two called two marketing. Words. Prove it. Mm -hmm. It's called marketing. Tell, tell them to prove it. Who are they? Prove it. That doesn't fly with the average man in the street, the bloke that votes. Or the, yeah. the That's okay. the problem. Here's one for you. Science is not a consensus. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's absolutely it's not. But people in the street don't understand that. It's all very well for us to say yeah, that yeah. here. You've yeah. got to get something that is um, a, a, a catch cry, a, a phrase yeah, yeah, that gets yeah. them, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. something that you can sell. Yeah. Yeah. If someone did an analysis of that 97% figure and all the papers it was supposed to be based on, they found it was precisely the other way around. 97% of scientists did not agree with global warming. Yeah, and, and the fact, the punchline is there is something to back it up with if you're going to say it. There is no climate emergency. Jenny? Jenny. There's another person um, that I saw here in Sydney seven years ago, Donna Laframboise. Laf 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 yeah. Yeah. And a yeah. yeah, delinquent yeah. teenager, and she explains exactly how, when, and where the and the constitution of the IPCC. Mm -hmm. And apparently, all the people that were doing the research. We're just students of anything, and they mm. just put them in a room, and they all reviewed each other. Anyway, she she sets it out in, in chapter and verse. She's still around. She's Canadian, and she's uh, a, a, a real investigative reporter, which there are very few on the ground. Mm. For those listening, if you don't have a copy of the book, I've got it. Yeah, I have a soft copy of it. Yeah. Uh, PDF form. It's a great read. Yeah, uh, most yeah. libraries mm -hmm. have got a copy. Mm -hmm. Another five dollars yeah. library's got yeah. one because I, I arranged for them to, mm. to purchase it. Yeah. But I also have a soft copy. Of it. I've got it's quite yeah. it's a yeah. 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 Thank you. She's a great speaker too. Thank you. As our current speaker is. Thank you so much. Hang on. Right, right, right. All right. right. One more question. Not over yet. Um, thank you very much for that lecture. That was very interesting and very good. Um, what I wanted to ask, and I've read it on the internet, apparently now they want to cull about 53% of the cattle in Ireland. So is that correct? Yeah, because I mean, of these if you do carbon the sums emissions, on, on, supposedly, on the, yes? <clears throat> if you do the sums on the 2030 targets, mm. yes, there has to be a gigantic cutback in CO2. And one simple way that uh, one could do it would be to cull 50% of the cattle. But that, I mean, that, that is... Maybe that's what they're going to try and do here because we're going through a drought and no one's getting... They're not doing... They're doing some help, but maybe not enough. And maybe that's the plan to what's going on here. Possibly. Yeah, and play, uh, New Zealand, obviously, yeah. Mm. Um, but that's why it's so crucial that this work mm. by, by Happer and um, Van Weingarten is comes and gets published and of course they're having great difficulty in getting it published because they just don't want to have it and I mean that is you know you know that story that anything that is counter to the establishment science they just don't want to publish it. Okay. So do you think maybe the, UA, the EU and the UN are interconnected in a way as well because they both seem to be... Ah yes they are obviously yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, I, I, so. you know, even the Irish government is having a difficulty in that context because the farmers are very strong politically, oh, very strong politically, and they are <coughs> actually our best allies within the Irish Climate Science Forum. Good, good, very good. So love the farmers. Yeah, you, w we in ICSF, though we're a very small group, do have people who do actually quite a lot of work on analysing weather trends and temperature data. For example, like re a retired airline pilot, they know all about the weather. They have worked th right through it. But, uh, uh, so there's very good stuff. And again, some retired meteorologists, they can do very good analysis uh, of work. On your 97%, that is actually uh, very well... Yeah. And, and, and do it in a revised methodology, <laughs> not a cook at owl methodology. 
Yeah, but actually there, there's no basis, real basis for that figure. It was a completely, oh, yeah, oh, no. a completely... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, maybe I'm just thinking out loud that the, the our motto maybe becomes the 97% the debunked and there is no climate emergency is the, is the punchline. But yeah, I, I, we have lim very limited resources and of course no funding. S but a lot can be done, a lot can be done. Even even through the the voluntary work of people. Jim, if, you, if you just look at the questions that were asked, and that were asked the vast bulk of climate skeptics would fall into that ninety-seven percent. Don't you think that, that you know when you look at the questions? Those yes. questions, yeah. Yeah. Is a whole, most climate except most. Yeah, I mean we do all accept the climate is changing, yes. and I think most of us would accept that there is some influence of greenhouse well, gases on that. Right. So then you're in the ninety-seven. We're in the ninety-seven percent. Yeah, yeah, we are, but. You know, it's much less, and there is no emergency. That's that's the answer. That's uh, you do you do reasonable mitigation things because it makes sense to conserve energy and things like that, and and uh, but uh, you do it where it makes economic, scientific, economic, and social sense to do those things, and it's rational, basically. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, uh, there I've just jotted a few names down uh, on my uh, piece of paper here of other potential names th who, uh, who may be prepared to have uh, them included on the European Climate Declaration. So don't all rush off straight away. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, at the back of the room, Mike has been wait very patiently waiting with a deal of marketing material uh, that you're welcome to. It's, uh, it costs nothing, uh, I can assure you. If you're prepared to, uh, to utilise it um, on your car or wherever, but I've certainly got it on mine, I can guarantee you it works. Uh, our thanks again to Jim for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.